Welcome to uh, the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State University and an event on scholarly publishing. This is the second in a series on academic writing and uh, public writing in the humanities. The first we had was on style, this one on book publication, a university press, and then we'll have one on publishing in journals. And uh, then in March, we hope to do a series on grants and grant writing. So we hope you'll tune in for some of those as well. It's my pleasure right now to introduce Selena Asuna, who's the coordinator for Institute for Humanities Research and the assistant director for Desert Humanities. She'll introduce our speaker. Thank you for that, Ron, and welcome all. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the second event of the IHR Spring 2021 series on academic writing and publishing. And before we get started, I just want to point out that you may notice that chat has been disabled for the webinar. Please instead feel free to ask questions for our speaker at any time by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. With that, today the IHR and ASU is delighted to welcome Greg Britton. Greg is the editorial director of Johns Hopkins University Press, where he oversees the selection of 170 new books annually. He also acquires the press's award-winning list in higher education studies. Prior to his appointment at Hopkins, Britton directed Getty Publications at the Getty Museum Los Angeles. He's active in both the Association of American Publishers and the Association of University Presses, which gave him their 2016 Constituency Award. In 2018, the Council of Independent Colleges presented Hopkins with its Academic Leadership Award for their books in higher ed. And with that, I just want to say welcome, Greg. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to unmute there before I get started. It'll be much more interesting if, if we do that. Um, I'm happy to be here. I want to thank the Institute for Humanities Research. I want to thank Ron. Brolio for, um, for inviting me, for Selena and Liz and Lauren for their technical assistance and keeping things on track. It's an absolute pleasure to be at Arizona State um, today. Um, although I'm located in Baltimore where we have three or four inches of fresh snow on the ground. So imagine the brick streets of Baltimore covered with snow. It's, it's actually quite lovely. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, uh, scholarly publishing and the, um, uh, the ways that scholars, um, young and old, can work with university presses. Um, I have had uh, a long association with Arizona State. Um, uh, early on, had taught in a scholarly publishing certificates program at Arizona State run by Beth Louie. Um, I have published a number of Arizona State authors, including Devaney Lozier and George Justice, Will Daybar, Barry Bozeman, Derek Anderson, and, um, and of course, Michael Crow. I've published his last uh, two books and I'm working on a third right now. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's a delight to be um, with you all today. Um, I've worked at uh, university presses, around university presses and scholarly publishers for about 30 years. Um, university presses are a funny um, uh, hybrid uh, institution. They are attached to universities, but most of them operate as independent uh, entities to those universities. They range in, um, th there's as much different about university presses as there might be, as they might have in common. Um, the range uh, in terms of scale go anywhere from the very largest like Oxford University Press or the University of Chicago or, or Yale University Press down to some very small regional presses um, that perform a vital function of publishing scholarship in their, in their field. And you think of places like Kent State University Press or the University of Arizona Press and, and ones like that. Um, that um, what, what links all of these presses, though, is that they publish um, scholarship and, and, uh, and regional books and trade books, um, and they do so in an environment that is, um, has a scholarly focus and, um, and most importantly, they rely on peer review. That is that everything they publish is, um, 
is subject to a, a rigorous decision making process. And what I'd like to talk about today is how um, how you as a scholar can help navigate that process. Um, uh, if if I've done my job right, I can make this um, as transparent as possible. Um, uh, these university presses, some receive subsidies from their institutions, but most, um, uh, as with most things, the, those subsidies are going down. And that means the economics of university press publishing are, um, are something that we watch very carefully. Um, as an editor, I am selecting books for their, uh, that I think are important and will have a lasting impact on a field. I also am keenly aware of the economics of making that decision. And so any book I publish um, needs to be able to contribute to a bottom line. And I don't mean to put that in as crass a terms as that. It's, um, uh, it's not that we're looking to enrich the press or enrich the institution. In fact, most uh, presses are, um, are not um, financially sustainable. Um, but the goal is to become sustainable. And the reason we want to um, make money on any one book or any one project is so that we um, are able to do it again. Okay, so I want to publish a book and do well enough with it so that I can turn around and publish more of those books. Um, and so I think of it as, as an editor, I'm making a decision really based on um, two bottom lines. One is an intellectual and a scholarly bottom line, and the other is, is a really practical financial bottom line. So that's always in the back of my mind as, um, as a university press editor. Before I get into more of that, I'd like to say a little bit about my own press. Um, I work at the Johns Hopkins University Press. We're among one of the larger um, university presses in America. Um, we do uh, really four things that, that contribute to um, the scholarly ecosystem. First, we publish a line of, of books. Um, uh, Selena said we publish about 170 new books a year. Um, we've been doing, uh, we've been publishing books since the mid 1870s. We're the, the oldest university press in America. And um, that's something we're really proud of. Um, in addition to publishing those books, we have a very um, built out journals program. We have 101 journals that we publish at the, at the press. Um, those are scholarly journals from associations all over the world. Um, the third thing we do is we have a book fulfillment program, which does um, uh, book fulfillment, both print and digital fulfillment uh, for about 12 other university presses and scholarly associations. And then the fourth thing we do, which you may not be aware of, is we run Project Muse, um, the digital aggregator um, of, of, of journal and book content that you, you log on to your library website and have access to all this material. Um, um, and have for 25 years. Um, that's Project Muse and that's a Hopkins invention. Um, it's something we're really proud of. And it's um, whenever I'm acquiring a book, I'm thinking how it's going to, um, how it's going to sell in the world as a print book, but how it's also going to sell in the world as a digital product and how it's going to be served up through Project Muse. Um, that broad perspective makes the press, um, I think, unique in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but today, I want to talk about the, um, the book publishing program. Most university presses specialize in certain fields. Um, even a press the size of, of the University of Chicago or Columbia University Press or the University of California Press, um, those presses don't publish any book of scholarship that comes through the door. They focus in specific ways. They have fields of interest that, um, uh, that they're looking for books in. Um, we call those lists, okay? Um, so the lists that Hopkins publishes in, in the humanities are literary studies, American history, the history of science, technology, and medicine. We publish in ancient studies and we publish in education. On the STEM side of the equation, we have a really active life science list 
we have a very strong public health list, which as you can imagine, with um, the interest in epidemiology these days is doing really well. I'm really excited about um, the work we do in public health um, and related to that, the health humanities. Um, and then finally, we have a strong list in health and wellness. Uh, books that come out of the Hopkins um, School of Medicine that are that are aimed at um, uh, helping people understand um, their health and wellness. Um, all of that points to something uh, that, uh, well, let me circle back and talk a little bit about how I think of books. Um, books are one form of scholarly communications that we engage in. And we've known for a while that scholars communicate in lots of different ways. Um, that, that conversation, that scholarly conversation anyway, is really um, comes out in different ways. We, we communicate at conferences, we communicate through journals, um, uh, articles, we, com we communicate through, through seminars, but we increasingly are communicating on social media, we're communicating in the popular press, we're communicating in podcasts and in blogs, and, um, and books are are no longer the only way scholars communicate, we're, but they are but they are a major form and they have unique affordances that, um, that as an editor I'm watching for. I think of books as being these sort of nodes in an ongoing conversation in any field of scholarship. As, as such, editors become a sort of, um, I think of editors as sort of colleagues or um, maybe unindicted co-conspirators in that scholarly communications, um, uh, in that scholarship that happens. Um, the, uh, in certain fields, editors who have, have worked that field for a long time really do help shape that field and can help shape your own scholarship. What I really love is when a young scholar comes to an editor before or as at the very earliest stages of a project and asks, um, asks those important questions that editors and authors should talk about. Um, uh, what, what the, the converse of that is people who, uh, ed, ed, authors who turn up final manuscripts and say, here's my work, um, take it or leave it. I would much rather a young scholar um, come to us early and say, I'm thinking of a project that aims in this direction or is answering this question. And, um, uh, and that's more interesting to me because I, I think um, I can bring or an editor can bring their expertise in the field to help shape that work and make it a more successful project. Um, the um, the question that I'm often asked is, is what a university press editor is looking for? Like what, what are they, you know, what's the secret to getting published at a university press? Um, really, um, I, so we publish, I said about 170 books a year. Personally, I acquire our books in higher education studies um, and I'm publishing a about 25 or 30 books a year, which is a book every two weeks. Um, uh, to get those 25 books that I think are worth publishing and are, are um, I really want on our list, um, I'm, I'm probably seeing 100, 150 proposals a year. Um, now, when those, when, and, and there are eight editors at Hopkins um, each uh, focus in those in those core areas that I talked about, and each of those editors are getting that many proposals. So you can imagine the email volume of those of those proposals coming in. And the first the first question I ask any proposal is um, is uh, does this fit what we do? Does this fit those core areas? Um, and if it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's the most brilliant piece of scholarship I've ever seen. 
if, if it doesn't fit, it's not something we're going to publish. And the reason we do that is, um, is that there's editorial expertise, but there's also market expertise. We know how to sell a book on public health because we have sold hundreds of books on public health. We are looked to as the publisher in the field of public health. And so I'm looking for more books on public health. Um, if a book comes in and it is on um, an anthropology, you know, it's an anthropology book on, on um, Central American studies, um, that's a book, it might be brilliant, but it doesn't fit what we publish. And so I'm likely to reject that book. So for a young scholar looking for, the, uh, for a publisher, my advice is to find a publisher who publishes in that field. Um, now, how do you do that? Um, uh, back when we had in-person conferences, you could walk around in an exhibit hall and see the publishers who were exhibiting books in that field. Um, it's more difficult to do these days, so it requires some, some homework. Um, another way you can find the right publisher in a field is to look at your own bookshelf Look at the most contemporary books you have on that shelf and look at the spines. You'll start to see that certain presses emerge in that field. Um, if you're in um, uh, indigenous studies, Native American studies, you might see that Oklahoma pops up all the time on the spines of your books or Yale University Press or Cornell um, or Minnesota. Those are key publishers in that field. Um, so what you really want to do is find a publisher who is, who is likely to be interested in your topic. So that's the first thing I look for. The second thing I'm always looking for is this, is, is this, um, uh, is this book coming at the right time? Um, is there something timely about this book? And by timely, I don't necessarily mean an urgency, but is it addressing where we are in this in that scholarly conversation at this point. Does this look like a book that we should publish now, or does this look like something that we would have published 15 years ago? If it's timely, I'm interested in it. Third, I want a book that's argument driven. Um, I don't need a book that's going to rehash what we already knew. I want a book that makes an argument about the next, uh, that moves that conversation further. The fourth thing that I'm interested in is that this book have, or this project have an identifiable audience. Is it written for a general audience? Is it written for a community of other scholars who are having that conversation? Is it written for students in an introductory level class? Um, is it written for professionals in a field? Um, those are all legitimate audiences, but I wanna know that this book is written to that audience, and um, and I can immediately spot those books where the author says this book is written for everyone. I think this book is written for no one, and um, and I'm less likely to be interested in that. Fourth, I'm really interested in the writing, the quality of the writing of the book. As scholars, you read, um, you've read hundreds of books, and you know the difference in impact that a beautifully written book has over one that is written in a, um, in a less felicitous way. Um, I think the quality of writing, it, it, it comes through in a proposal and it can come through in, um, in the manuscript. Um, again, one of those bottom lines that I'm trying to achieve is impact for the book and, and the quality of the writing is gonna is going to help on that impact. Um, next, I'm looking for an author who is um, who is engaged in some way in their scholarly community, and that engagement can take many different forms. Um, I I was once talking about this and use the word platform. I'm looking for authors with a platform and someone blanched and said, you mean Twitter followers? And, um, and that's not exactly what I mean, although that may be a measure of, of engagement. I'm looking more importantly for someone who is, um, who is active in the profession, 
who is active in those conversations. And that, that conversation, as I said, could happen in lots of different places. Participation in conferences, participation in workshops, participation in journals, um, or it could be, it could take the form of engagement in social media. Um, I know that the editors working at Hopkins are watching social media and they're watching who's talking about what. Um, it's, it's one way that we um, participate in that conversation. It's, it's one way that we, in some ways, I, I, I think editors are embedded in a scholarly field. We are not scholars ourselves, um, although many of us have scholarly backgrounds. Um, but what we really are is, is like those embedded journalists who are, who are alongside the soldiers, not fighting, but are recording things as, as the fight goes on. Um, and then the last thing, those are the first six things which were fit, uh, timeliness, argument driven, um, I, an identifiable audience, the quality of the writing, the author's engagement. The last thing that, and it's maybe the highest bar that I look for in a manuscript is, uh, or in a proposal, is that it answer a question that always comes up with scholarly writing, which is, so what? Why does this book matter? Okay, who needs this book? And if we can, if we can identify that, if you can help me answer that question, um, then I think this is a book I want to publish. Okay, and that it's that so what question, it's connecting this book with the larger conversation that's so important to me. Editors can help you do that, um, which is why I think it's important to talk with an editor early on. They can help you shape and shift that book in a way that, that may be most effective. Um, but it's, um, uh, but it's, and it's sometimes, it's a hard question to answer, but I think it's worth, um, it's worth taking on. Um, how are we doing time-wise, Selena? We are doing great time-wise. Um, I don't know if you have any further points. I'm happy to also, we have a couple of questions already. Why don't we jump in with questions because um, I'm tired of hearing myself talk and I'm interested in what people would like to know. You know you have, <laughs> I should say, if you're participating and uh, you have questions, shoot them to us and we'll try to, to answer those. Yeah, thank you so much, Greg. I mean, you're, you might be tired of hearing yourself. But I'm not tired of hearing you uh, give, these, give your wisdom. Um, I will just go directly to our first audience question, which is basically uh, Johns Hopkins University Press, like other presses, has a number of series that you publish. Um, so it's an easy series question. When you are contracting new book projects, are you, are you principally looking for books that will fit into those series that are already set up or standalone projects? So that's a it's a it's a really good question about series. There are some university presses who have t lots of series and are really active about feeding those series. Um, I tend to be light on series. I'm more interested in a book that stands on its own because ultimately, in the world, a book has to stand on its own. That that being said, a series could be a an identified. Um, it could be one of those things that that shows you that the press is interested in building out in that in that field. The, the other reason that we use series is that a series editor, who's usually a scholar in the field, um, is a sort of an extension of the editor. Um, I, I can't know everything. And so there are certain series editors who, who are bringing me books that I, I wouldn't normally have seen. So it's a great question. Thank you. Helpful, helpful answer. Um, our next question is, what impact does the relative profile and or institutional affiliation of a prospective author weigh in a press decision to proceed with a proposed book? Which I think is a fantastic question. It, it really is. Um, higher education is, um, is, has always been a status economy that we 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 measure each other by by all sorts of markers that are unrelated to the quality of our work, where we went to college, where we went to graduate school, where who we studied with, um, the the um, 
the grants we've we've received and all uh, all of those things. Um, and so it is it is difficult to break out of that. And I realize how much it reifies the privilege and status of certain groups. Um, knowing that, we work hard to um, uh, and and working with my editors to to step back from that and say, let's look at the quality of this work. Is this person, you know, um, is this person saying something that we have never seen before? That is such a new idea that we think has the power and the impact. Um, that's the book I want to publish, rather than, you know, Professor So and So from fancy university in New England. Um, uh, sometimes books, good books, come from those places too, but they also come from really unexpected places, um, and. Uh, and those are the things that make an editor's pulse race. Awesome. That's, it's really heartening to hear you acknowledge um, sometimes the privilege and status that comes with these circles, right, with university presses especially. Um, so thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question that I'm kind of chomping at the bit to ask you about what makes a proposal stand out because they're not long usually the press is not asking for the entire <clears throat> um and you're looking at a lot of them so are there any just tips that what makes that that proposal itself stand out so so there are some editors and and people who who um coach editors or coach authors who really work at honing a proposal and developing the perfect proposal that has the elegant pitch and the perfect sample chapter and the table of contents and all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to mute that. Sorry. I, um, I want to propose something different, which is instead of the perfect proposal that you send you identify the right editor. This requires homework. Identify the right editor. Send them an email that is um, that's two or three paragraphs that says, "Listen, Greg, I'm working on a book on X, and I'm thinking it should do these three things. And here's the question I'm trying to answer. And here's who I'm trying to write it. To. Here's the audience. Here's who I'm writing it for. Is this something you're interested in?" If it is, I'm going to write you back and say, that's really interesting. Have you thought of covering this and this in that list? Now we're starting a conversation. And, um, and then uh, we might refine that. We might go back and forth a little bit. And then I'll say, you know, this is start, starting to sound like something I'm interested in. Could you write me a proposal? So all of a sudden, you have engaged me with your idea. And we're starting to brainstorm about how to make this a little bit better. Maybe making it a little bit better is expanding the, the, the chronology you're looking at, um, adding geographic um, diversity to your project, or maybe it's to just, you know, instead of looking at it with a magnifying glass, stepping back and looking at it with a little more of a perspective. Um, I, that's the conversation that shapes a book rather than a finished proposal or a finished manuscript. That's a sort of take it or leave it um, proposal or a, a take it or leave it pr proposition. So because of that, I'm less, um, I'm less enamored with the idea of the perfect proposal. And I think people really struggle with trying to get it exactly right to attract that editor. That really creates a lot more depth um, to the back and forth with the editor. So I appreciate that insight. And I actually think this feeds into one of the questions we've gotten, which is kind of a, a counterpoint, right? A little bit of a, I'd love to hear your answer to this, but they, uh, this person says, you've said that you like it when a scholar comes to an editor early in a project, right? And the counter argument that this person has heard is that you could come to an editor too early 
before you're ready to get onto a solid timeline, which I think is crucial. And the excitement over the project can kind of lose momentum. By the time you show up with an actual proposal, the interest is kind of deflated. How do you recommend striking the right balance here? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I um, I sometimes go to the same conferences year after year, and I know there is one scholar who has pitched me the same book idea for about eight years. And at that point, I think I'm never going to see this. And this person is doing something else for their ego to tell me about this work they're they're working on. So that's maybe the counter, uh, an example of, of um, I have sort of lost interest in this only because I think I will never see it. Um, um, you know, I'm always in favor of, of uh, authors who work at a certain pace and, and can finish a project that they've started, but I, I don't mind um, hearing about a project early on. Again, we've been publishing since the 1870s. We've learned to be really patient. So. That is so to help put in perspective, right? 1870s <laughs> to now. Um, I think this is almost in line with some of the, the questions we've been getting about institutional affiliation, but this is from a PhD student wrapping up their final year. And I think this speaks for a lot of PhD students that I know currently writing their dissertation, they want to eventually publish their research with an academic press, at what point should I approach a press and how likely is the press to accept the proposal from an early career researcher? Right, um, so at once at an academic conference, a, a professor who I knew, who was an author of mine, brought over their grad student and said, my grad student is thinking of writing her dissertation on she has two or three ideas. Could she talk to you about those ideas? And we sat down and talked for 15 minutes about them. And by the time she was finished, she had picked the one that was the most publishable idea. And now she's gone off and will work on that project. And I was it was flattering to be asked, but I realized what was really happening is the student was getting the advantage of picking a topic that was publishable because two of the other topics that she was considering were not things with, that would turn into, would not lend themselves to, readily to being a book. And so I actually think, and some of my editorial colleagues might disagree, that it's never too early to just chat with an editor. Um, now that was easier in the days where you could at, maybe at a conference run into someone or you could afford to get to a conference. Um, we're not doing that these days. Um, and, and you have to figure out other ways of, um, of, of reaching out to those editors. It, whether you're connecting with those editors or not, um, it's in, if, if the goal is to make it a book, then it should be conceived of as a book really early on. So there's something else I want to say about that, and I'll, I'll do this really quickly, which is um, for those of you who are working on a dissertation or have finished a dissertation and are interested in making it into a book, it's good to know that the two things are really different products. One is written for an audience of precisely four people um, who care very deeply that you have read everything that they have read and that you can demonstrate that. A book is written for an audience of uh, an N of, 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 uh, of an indeterminate number um, and is written um, for people who don't care that you rehearse, that you have read everything. They would rather see it in your argument than in presented in chapter two, your lit review. Um, there are other main differences, but um, uh, um, another one that comes immediately to mind is um, the theory that you espouse in a dissertation. In a book, we want to see the theory worn very lightly. Let it inform your argument. You don't have to rehearse the theory for us. Um, there is a fantastic resource for those who are turning a dissertation into into a book, and it's Bill Germano's book, which I didn't publish, but I'm going to try to sell it to you anyway. This is Bill Germano's book, From Dissertation to Book, 
in its second edition now, published by my colleagues at the University of Chicago Press. Um, it is about 120 pages, and it is the best single resource you will read in, in, in the process, explaining the process of moving from a dissertation to a book. Um, I can't recommend it enough, so. Thank you. Um, can never have too many resources for grad students about changing the dissertation into a book, so appreciate that. And actually, in that vein, I'm curious, in your role as editor, how much are you having to do that coaching with somebody who comes in really heavily entrenched in academic theory? Um, how much of that coaching do you do? Is that part of your job? You know, it's, um, I would love to say that I do a ton of that coaching and the reality is I don't because, um, because I'm in the fortunate position of being ruthlessly selective. I'm looking for things that are mostly Mostly that heavy work has been done and um, or the author is capable of doing it. Um, it's, it's just given the, given the volume of publishing that, that an, a university press editor does, the amount of that work is, is pretty low. That actually does lead into another question we have. And we have two more questions before, I think another question that kind of addresses publishing careers. So we'll get to that just one post that. Um, but we have seen how university presses maybe unintentionally have played a big role on shaping the unequal global scholarly publishing system. So you've addressed that somewhat. And university uh, presses contribute to increase the dynamics of prestige that include many scholars. Is there something on your agenda, and I know you already spoke to this, to help reverse this issue? Is this something that Johns Hopkins is passionate about? You know, it's. Um, we are absolutely guilty of this and it is something that um, universities have um, have uh, been thinking about and and talking amongst ourselves about how we have been culpable and how we can fix it the first thing that um, i think university presses should do and several of them are taking steps in this direction is to to, to diversify their staffs um, editorial staffs of publishing not just university press publishing um, but publishing in in america is overwhelmingly white and middle class and um, and it is reflected in the books they publish um, University presses are actually doing slightly better than the larger um, publishing community, but um, uh, it's we're still a far cry from being uh, uh, to reflecting the um, diversity of scholars in America, and that's something that that we're working to change in our hiring practices. It's difficult, partly because university presses are not a sort of growing business, so we're adding lots of staff where we can easily diversify. It sort of happens in drips and drabs. Um, several university presses have internship programs to bring in um, um, diverse candidates, um, young scholars who, who, are, um, who are helping us think more broadly about the books we publish and how we publish them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that, um, I talk to a lot of other editorial directors and it's something that comes up all the time, how we can fix this, so. It's good to know that my, I think the audience member for that question because it's something that I don't know that everyone thinks about, right? Yeah. And this has come up a couple different times in questions, um, but basically does, uh, do presses like Johns Hopkins ever redirect authors to competitors in other words, when you're presented with an idea you think has value but might not be for you, do you bring to bear your knowledge and experience to suggest alternatives? And the, the flip side of that we got was somebody asking if editors sometimes might snipe ideas. <laughs> um, they may what ideas? They may snipe ideas. like get Oh, yeah. So editors, university press editors are, um, we're sort of frenemies. Um, we, uh, we know each other, we compete for the, for the very best projects, we compete for them, and, um, and like any competition, it can, it, can be, um, it can be tough. And at the end of the day, 
we sit down and have a beer together. Um, it's 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 a group that is collegial, and we but we also know we're working in the same field. Um, now, I uh, because I'm really interested in university presses, and I and when someone says I have a book on X. Um, I always think, oh, that's a California book, or oh, that's a Cornell book, or Virginia would love this book. I um, I always recommend that um, that you know I'll I'll reject the project um, because it doesn't fit us, um, and then I'll say uh, it's not for us. But take this to Virginia; they'll like this. Um, I and I think uh, other editors do that as well. I'll sometimes get a proposal that says. Princeton says you should publish this. <laughs> All right. Um, so we'll switch gears a little to the career aspect. And this is from somebody who's worked as a manuscript editor in book publishing and freelance for about a year. They have an editing certificate and they're pursuing an MA right now. Uh, one of the goals that they have is to work for an academic press, either freelance or in-house. Do you have any advice regarding a general pathway for me to work for a press? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question, and um, and uh, I think it's it's important for anyone in the humanities to be looking at where other careers are. Um, uh, I can say a little bit about my own trajectory, which I began. Uh, I was uh, working on a dissertation at the University of Wisconsin in the history program, and one summer started editing books on the side to make a little spare cash, and. Um, the press I was working for hired me, uh, and it. At a certain point, I realized um, that in my program, smarter people than me were finishing and struggling to find those jobs, um, and I thought maybe, maybe I have a job here, and that has turned into a remarkable career that's been really satisfying. I've been able to work within the field. Um, but also slightly outside of it. Um, and um, I've been, I've, the, it's been really satisfying. Um, that's getting your foot in the door. And like most jobs, there's some serendipity and some chance, but it's also putting yourself in the right place to be, to, to have um, an opportunity, to take advantage of an opportunity. Um, let me describe this a different way. At the Johns Hopkins University Press, remember we do books and big journals program and Project Muse and book fulfillment. There are 140 people on staff at that press. Eight of them are scholarly editors, okay? That means there are 132 people working at a university press who are not called editors. And they're doing all sorts of really interesting jobs. Um, and, and those are in, marketing and in sales and in, in book production and in manuscript editing and in finance and you know in accounting and um and technology um someone said to me oh i want to be an editor because i love to read and um and i thought oh i look around my office and the people who read the most are not the editors the editors are are busy um horse trading with with authors and finalizing contracts and getting a project um, submitted at the right time. And the people who are reading the most in the office are the publicists who have to read a book of scholarship, distill it to a single sentence or so, so that when they're presenting this book to the Amazon book buyer, that they, or, or a university store um, a book buyer, they have, they have two minutes to describe this book and they, they have read and can describe a book like no one else. Um, and it's because they read so much. So um, the point I'd like to make is that there are lots of publishing jobs and they're not necessarily editorial jobs. So sort of a long answer to that question, but. No, I think it's fantastic. I think it does open up another, well, lots of other possibilities to PhD students who might be realizing that the traditional career path might not be for them if they want right. to in publishing. So, you know, there, there are also, there are university presses, but publishing also happens at scholarly associations. It happens at journals programs. 
It happens in universities. Um, uh, if, if someone is just interested in publishing, publishing happens in a lot of places that maybe not, don't immediately look like publishers. Thank you. Um, we have another question for MAs or PhDs. What steps would you recommend for MAs or PhDs to make sure they're in the room where the opportunities are? Um, should they focus on copy editing and marketing opportunities while in grad school? And I will maybe add on to this. COVID-19 and the pandemic has kind of added to uh, obstacles for having these opportunities. Yeah, this is the Hamilton question, you know, how, how you're in the room, um, the room where it happens. So um, the pandemic has uh, posed some real challenges, but I want to talk to you about a real opportunity that has also emerged, which is we used to hire people to move to Baltimore and sit in an office building and do their work. And, and that meant the people we were recruiting had to make a hard decision. Did they want to move across the country to take this job? That may not be the last job, but, but it required that move. Um, since the pandemic, we hire people anywhere they are and um, and they can do that work from uh, do that work virtually. That's changed um, the the opportunity for us in hiring new staff, but it's also really opened up the opportunity for people to take jobs that are not uh, um, uh, geographically specific to where they are. That's. That's a game changer in a field where networking has. Yeah, and we're trying to figure that out as well. So we don't have this, you know, everybody's just making this up as they go. So um, as with anything, um, opportunity happens at that intersection between preparation and chance. And so um, uh, it's, there is a serendipity to, to everything in life, but you can put yourself in the right place um, and make sure that, that you're, you're available when it happens. And that I think goes well with another question we have, who is a contingent faculty member in history with a job that's 100% service and teaching. So obviously not research-based, but they're wondering if you have any recommendations for how to keep their foot in the door for opportunities, um, or rather how to not miss the window for publishing the research from their dissertation as a monograph and they finished in a couple years ago. Yeah, I think this is really, it's so hard for contingent faculty to, um, to do that because there is no reward for it. In fact, it takes away from the time that they would be doing service or teaching. Um, I think the system itself is 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 grossly flawed in that way, um, and um, and at exactly the time that having a published book may help that person, they have no resources or or course relief or economic incentive to publish a book, um, and it um, and I think it it raises all sorts of of uh, questions of of justice and and. Uh, uh, equality um, in in academic system that rewards publication. Um, people publish, you know, why publish a book? You publish a book because you want to have um, an impact on a field, but you're rewarded by tenure and promotion and all these other things. Um, and we we set those bars high, and then we we remove resources to allow people to reach them. I, it's um, it's really it's incredibly frustrating. So yeah, it sounds like uh, that's a problem to be. <laughs> yeah, that was that was such um, that was such an that answer was not helpful at all. But I I just I want to recognize that I see the the flaw in the system. Um, and it was but it was honest as well, which I think that hopefully that faculty member can appreciate the honesty there. And it's, it's good to know that it is acknowledged as an issue. Right. What I can tell you is that um, as an editor and, and my editors, 
you know, it's back to that status question. We don't say, um, uh, well, I actually once in a faculty editorial board meeting, we have an advisory board made up of faculty, um, um, some uh, a professor uh, said, uh, um, this project looks really good, but this person is only an adjunct. And I, I stopped the meeting and, and uh, laid, laid out the, the case for why that's simply not appropriate to talk about and to consider in whether we approve this project or not. Um, and um, the person later wrote me and apologized for, for having, having judged the, the project on that merit. I think we simply can't do that. I can do nothing but agree and applaud you there because right. I agree heartily. Um, we have time for, I think, two more questions. And the first one of those is, um, if you've spoken with an editor early on and worked to develop your project for that editor, but in the later stages, the editor decides to pass on the book, how should you approach another editor um, with more or less a fully formed project and how forthcoming should you be about those earlier conversations with the previous editor? You know, I don't know that you should raise it with um, with the the subsequent subsequent editor, but I would hope that from the earlier conversations, the project will have been um, more further developed. Um, I think, you know, maybe it's a better project now having gone through that. So. Thank you. Um, and so this is our last question. And I, I think I just want to give us room to, to really breathe and, and listen to your take on this. But um, what is the function of books today? And I think also this, this question is dealing with form, right? And there are short books, small books, large tomes. Can you discuss book types and lengths and the purpose of each? And maybe not inexhaustively talk about each form, right? But how do you and the author decide which, uh, what sort of book works best for what sort of project? Right. So if I if I look at our um, across controlling across all the lists, the fields we're in, and if I control for price and if I control for um, topic and all of that. I know that shorter books are selling better these days than longer books. And that's, um, uh, and I think if you think of your own reading habits, that may be the case that, um, you know, a 200 page book, you, you're able to knock off one of those in, um, in a couple of days. Um, if it's an 800 page book, you sort of set it aside and think, I really need to read that, but, um, uh, but it's on your, bedside table and then the next 800 page book shows up a week later and and books pile up like that. Um, I think uh, uh, the world needs big books and the world needs small books and um, and uh, and they are part of that conversation. Books though have they not every not every part of communication needs to be a book. Um, it's, there are all sorts of ways we communicate, but books do certain things. Books persist over time. Books are easy to discover and easy to, um, to share. Um, and books have a way of fixing an argument in a way that persists over space and time. And that gives them a power that, say, a podcast or a blog that might reach a hundred thousand people, um, it still doesn't persist over time in the same way that a book might. And those are that doesn't make one better than the other. It just means that they have different um, they have different superpowers. And I I like to think um, that uh, that books will persist um, even in this age of new media. Um, it's because they do something and have for about five hundred years that we have not been able to replicate in any other way. So. That's so powerful. It's so nice to hear a reflection on books that's positive, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's um, yeah. I think, I don't know. I kind of am curious about the second part of the question, which is how do you then um, work with an author that might have pitched maybe an 80,000 
forward and say, actually, this might work better as a 60,000 or when does that happen and how? Yeah, it's, it's um, the more disturbing conversation happens in the other direction when they've turned in 300,000 words and you think, you know what, this deserves to be 100,000 words. You have to cut two thirds of this book or completely reconceive of it. And that's, that's heartbreaking. It's asking for radical surgery from an author who's put in that amount of work. I like, that's again, why we like to have those conversations early on so they don't go to that. You know, um, just as books have their own affordances, um, there, are, there are really different types of books. There are books that are totally pathbreaking and do something new. And there are books that are synthetic and, and summarize what we know in a really coherent, um, uh, brilliant way. And, and there are books that are multi-authored that, that have a conversation within them. And, um, and all of those have, have a, a place. Um, uh, it's funny, it, it sort of goes to that question of audience, which comes up almost immediately when I'm talking to an author, is who are you writing this for? And sometimes the audience is different than they started. You know, they, they begin to write a book and it's, they're writing it for an audience they didn't immediately identify. Um, and that's sort of exciting to see happen. So. I like the idea of every book has a place. <laughs> I think that's a nice note to end on. Um, did you have any last thoughts before we wrap um, that you didn't get to cover? You know, I, I just want to say I, I, I want to recognize how difficult it has been this last year for people to um, to maintain their scholarship and their writing schedules along with um, teaching online and um, the anxieties over everything that we as a people are are coping with now. And um, I um, all of my authors have missed their deadlines this year and they are all forgiven, um, but they, if they're listening, they should um, get back to work and, and, uh, and turn in their work. Um, and then finally, I'm reminded of William Stafford's admonition when people are struck with writer's block is to lower your standards and keep moving. Um, it's um, for all of us, we should just lower our standards a little bit and keep moving. Wow. I'm ready to do that right now <laughs> in terms of my writing I mean, permission there's your permission you, thank you appreciate it um thank you so much greg um this has been a fantastic and helpful practical presentation and discussion um i know that our our faculty and students from asu and beyond that have come and joined us today are going to benefit so much from your wisdom and resourcefulness so just want to thank you um, well, thanks, and please reach out to me on social media if you'd like. I'm pretty active on Twitter, and um, or you can track me down and email me if you have follow-up questions. That sounds great. And um, the IHR, on behalf of the IHR, we hope you'll join us um, for our final event in the series on academic writing and publishing, which is Journal Publishing with Alexander Rechier, and that'll be on Tuesday, February 16th at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. And through this series, we are hoping to provide you scholars with the insights that you need to successfully publish books, journal articles, and develop your engaging writing styles for academic content and beyond. And just thank you all for being here today with us.